sorry. Two bunches of violets trot in the mud. A full eyes white is. Why don't you look where you're going? Will you fetch a taxi, Freddy? Do you want me to catch pneumonia? I'm sorry, Mother. I'll fetch a taxi right away. Sorry. Oh, he's your son, is he? Well, if you'd done your duty by him as a mother should, you wouldn't let him spoil a poor girl's flowers and then run away without paying. Go on about your business, my girl. Two bunches of violets trot in the mud. Taxi! I say, Captain, buy a flower off a poor girl. I'm sorry, I haven't any change. I can change half a crown. Yeah, take this for tuppence. I'm sorry, I really haven't any... Stop. Here's three happens if that's any use to you. Thank you, sir. You better give him a flower for it. There's a bloke there, behind the pillar, taking down every blessed word you're saying. Ow, oh, I ain't done nothing wrong by speaking to the gentleman. I've a right to sell flowers if I came off the curb. I'm a respectable girl, so help me. I never spoke to him except to ask him to buy a flower off me. What's the row? What's all the blooming noise? There's a tech taking her down. Oh, sir, don't let him charge me. You know what it means to me. They'll take away my character and drive me off the streets for speaking to the gentleman. There, there, there. Who is hurting you, you silly girl? What do you take me for? On my Bible oath, I never said a word. Oh, shut up. Shut up. Do I look like a policeman? And what did you take down my words for? How do I know whether you took me down right? You just show me what you wrote about me. Yeah, what's that? That ain't proper writing. I can't read that. I can. I say, Captain, buy a flower for my poor girl. I say. Oh, it's because I called him Captain. Oh, sir, I meant no harm. Don't let him charge me. Charge? I make no charge. Really, sir, if you are a detective, you needn't protect me from molestation by a young woman unless I ask you. Anybody could see that the girl meant no harm. Here, yeah, Tech. Here, yeah, gentlemen, look at his boots. And how are your people down at Celsi? Who told you my people came from Celsi? Never mind, they did. How did you come to be up so far east? You were born in Listen Grove. Oh, what harm is there in my leaving Listen Grove? It wasn't fit for a pig to live in, and I had to pay four and six a week. Get where you like, but stop that noise. Come, come, you have a right to live where you please. I'm a good girl, I am. Do you know where I come from? Hoxton. Well, who said I didn't? Limey, you know everything you do. Tell them where he comes from if you want to go fortune telling. Cheltenham, Harrow, Cambridge in India. Quite right. Blimey. He ain't a gentleman. He's a blooming busybody, that's what he is. Uh, may I ask, sir, do you do this sort of thing for a living on the music halls? I have thought of that. Perhaps I will someday. He's no gentleman, he's not, to interfere with a poor girl. Uh, but how do you do it, if I may ask? Simple phonetics, the science of speech. That's my profession, also my hobby. Anybody can spot an Irishman or Yorkshireman by his broke. I could place a man within six miles. I can place him within two miles in London, sometimes even two streets. Ought to be ashamed of himself, unmanly coward. But is there a living in that? Oh yes, quite a fat one. Lee mind his own business and leave a poor girl. Woman, cease this detestable boohooing instantly, or else seek the shelter of some other place of worship. I'm all right to be here if I like, same as you. A woman who utters such depressing and disgusting noises has no right to be anywhere, no right to live. Remember that you are a human being with a soul and the divine gift of articulate speech and that your native language is the language of Shakespeare and Milton and the Bible and don't go on crooning like a bilious pigeon. Meow. Look at her, a prisoner of the gutter, condemned by every syllable she utters. By right she should be taken out and hung for the cold-blooded murder of the English tongue. Meow. This is what the British population calls an elementary education. Come, sir, I think you picked a poor example. Did I? Hear them down in Soho Square, dropping H's anywhere, speaking English any way they like. You, sir, did you go to school? They never taught him take instead of tyke. Hear a Yorkshireman or worse, hear a Cornishman converse. I'd rather hear a choir singing flat. 
chickens cackling in a barn. Just like this one. Gone. Gone. I ask you, sir, what sort of word is that? It's ow and gone that keep her in her place. Not her wretched clothes and dirty face. Why can't the English teach their children how to speak? This verbal class distinction by now should be antique. If you spoke as she does, sir, instead of the way you do, why, you might be selling flowers too. I beg your pardon? An Englishman's way of speaking absolutely classifies him. The moment he talks, he makes some other Englishman despise him. But one common language I'm afraid we'll never get. Why can't the English learn to Set a good example to people whose English is painful to your ears. The Scots and the Irish leave you close to tears. There are even some places where English completely disappears. In America, they haven't used it for years. Why can't the English teach their children how to speak? Norwegians learn Norwegian, the Greeks are taught their Greek. In France, every Frenchman learns his language from A to Z. They don't actually care what they do in France as long as they pronounce it properly. <laughs> Arabians learn Arabian with the speed of summer lightning. And Hebrews learn it backwards, which is absolutely frightening. But use proper English, you're regarded as a freak. Why can't the English... Why can't the English learn to speak? See this creature with her curbstone English? The English that will keep her in the gutters till the end of her days? Well, sir, in six months, I could pass her off as a duchess at the embassy ball. I can even get her a place as a lady's maid or shop assistant, which does require better English. Yeah, what's that you say? Yes, you squashed cabbage leaf. You disgrace to the noble architecture of these columns. You incarnate insults to the English language. I could make you the queen of Sheba. Taxi! Wow, you don't believe that, Captain. Well, anything is possible. I myself am a student of the Indian dialects. Are you now? Do you know Colonel Pickering, author of Spoken Sanskrit? I am Colonel Pickering. Who are you? Henry Higgins, author of Higgins, Universal Alphabet. I came from India to meet you. I was going to India to meet you. Higgins! Pickering! Where are you staying? At the Carlton. No, you're not. You are staying at 27A Wimple Street. Come with me and we'll have a jar over supper. Quite right. I say, sir, pay a flower. I'm short for my lodging. La, you said you could change half a crown. Oh, you ought to be stuffed with nails, you are. Yeah, take the whole blooming basket for sixpence. Sixpence. Ah, the church. A reminder. Indian dialects have always fascinated me. I have records of over 50. Ah. It's rather dull in town, I think I'll take me to Paris. Mm -hmm. My missus wants to open up a castle in Capri. Mm -hmm. Me doctor recommends a quiet summer by the sea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be lovely?
for me to eat Lots of cow make and lots of meat One face warm and one feet up wide And it'd be lovely Oh, so lovely sitting up so blooming lowly still I would never budge till spring Crabs over me when the sun Chitty bizarre. Drinks are to be paid for, not drunk. Come on, Doolittle. Ouch, go up it now. On the double. On the double. Oi, thanks for the hospitality, George. Send the bill to Buckingham Palace. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Alfie, guess it's home we go. Home? What are you going home for? Eliza should be here any minute, and she ought to be worth half a crown for her father who loves her so. Loves her? That's a laugh. You ain't been near in months. What does that have to do with anything? What does that have to do with half a crown? After everything I gave her. When did you ever give her anything? Anything? Yeah. I gave her everything. I gave her the greatest gift any human can give another. Life. I brought her here in this air world. The sun that shines and the moon that glows. Aiden Pike to take a nice crisp walk through on a spring night. I give her all of that and then... I disappears and leave her on her own. And if that ain't worth off a crown, I'll take my belt off and show what for. Uh, well, you gotta get awe, Alfie, but if you want the Afro crown, you're gonna have to have a good story to go with it. Oh, Loiza, what a surprise. Not a brass farthing. Come on, Loiza, would you really let me go home to your stepmother without a little bit of liquid protection? Stepmother? <laughs> stepmother indeed. Look, I'm the one that suffers by her, Eliza. I'm a slave to that woman, just because I ain't her lawful husband. Come on, Eliza, just half a crown. Well, I had a bit of luck myself tonight, so, yeah. But don't you keep coming around counting on half crowns from me. Thank you, Eliza, you're a noble daughter. See, boys, I told you not to go home. All it takes is faith, hope, and a little bit of luck. The Lord above gave man an arm of iron. So he could do his job and never shift. The Lord above gave man an arm of iron. But with a little bit of luck, with a little bit of luck, who's on the can work? With a little bit, with a little bit, with a little bit of luck, you'll never work. The 
the load above made liquor for temptation to see if man could turn away from sin. The load above made liquor for temptation, but with a little bit of luck, with a little bit of luck, when temptation comes, you won't give in. With a little bit, with a little bit, with a little bit of luck, you won't give in. Oh, you can walk the straight and narrow, but with a little bit of luck, you'll run amok. The gentle sex was made for man to marry, to share his nest and ensure his food is cooked. The gentle sex was made for man to marry, but with a little bit of luck, with a little bit of luck, you can have it all and not get booked. With a little bit, with a little bit, with a little bit of luck, you won't get hooked. supposed to get harassed. I'm trying to keep them quiet, lady. Oh, shut up once, bro. Just shut up. Hi, uh, is that any way to talk to a lady? We have to be neighborly like boys after all. The Lord above made man to help his neighbor. No matter where, on land or sea or foam. The Lord above made man to help his neighbor, but When he comes around, you won't be old. With a little bit, with a little bit, with a little bit of luck, you won't be old. They're always throwing goodness at you, but with a little bit of luck, a man can duck. Oh, it's a crime for man to go a spending, to fill his wife's poor heart with grief and doubt. Oh, it's a crime for man to go a spending, but won't find out with a little bit, with a little bit, with a little bit of luck. She won't find out with a little bit, with a little bit, with a little bit of blooming. I Good. say, Higgins, couldn't you turn on the lights? Go. Nonsense, you hear much better in the dark. But it's a fearful strain Fine. listening to all these vowel sounds. I'm quite done up for this <sighs> afternoon. Uh, Mr. Higgins, are you there? What is it, Mrs. Pierce? A young woman wants to see you, sir. A young woman? What does she want? Has she an interesting accent? Oh, something dreadful, sir. Let's have her up. Show her up, Mrs. Pierce. Very well, sir. It's for you to say. This is rather a bit of luck. I'll show you how I make records. We'll set her talking and I'll take her down in Bell's visible speech, and then in broad romic. And then we'll get her on the phonograph so that you can turn it on whenever you like with the written transcript before you. This is the young woman, sir. Oh no. This is the girl I jotted down last night. She's no use. I have all the records I want of the Listen Grove lingo, and I'm not going to waste another cylinder on it. Be off with you. Oh, don't you be so saucy. You ain't heard what I come for yet. Did you tell him I come in a taxi? Nonsense, girl. What do you think a man like Mr. Higgins cares which you came in? Oh, we are proud. He ain't above giving lessons, not him. I heard him say so. Well, I ain't come here to ask for any compliment. And if my money's not good enough, I can go elsewhere. Good enough for what? Good enough for you. Now you know, don't you? I've come to have lessons, I have. And to pay for them too, make no mistake. Well, what do you expect me to say? If you was a gentleman, you might ask me to sit down, I think. Don't I tell you I'm bringing your business? Pickering, shall we ask this baggage to sit down, or shall we throw her out the window? Ow, I won't be called a baggage when I've offered to pay like any lady. But what is it you want? I want to be a lady in a flower shop, instead of selling flowers at the corner of Tottenham Court Road. But them won't take me unless I can talk more genteel. And he said he could teach me. Well, here I am, ready to pay, not asking any favor. And he treats me as if I was dead. I know what lessons cost, and I'm ready to pay. How much? Now you're talking. 
I thought you'd come off it when you saw a chance of getting back a bit of what you chucked to me last night. You'd had a drop in, hadn't you? Sit down. Oh, if you're going to make a compliment of it. Sit. What is your name? Eliza Doolittle. Won't you sit down, Miss Doolittle? Oh, I don't mind if I do. How much do you propose to pay me for lessons? Oh, I know it's right. A lady friend of mine gets French lessons from a real French gentleman for high ten pence an hour. Now, you wouldn't have the face to ask me the same for teaching me my own language as you would for French. So I won't give more than a shilling. Take it or leave it. You know, Pickering, if we were consi to consider a shilling, not as a simple shilling, but as a percentage of this girl's income, it works out to be 60 or 70 pounds from a millionaire. By George, that's the biggest offer I have ever had. 60 pounds? What are you talking about? I ain't got 60 pounds! Hold your tongue! But where would I get 60 pounds? <laughs> Don't cry, you silly girl. Sit down. No one's gonna touch your money. Somebody is going to touch you with a broomstick if you don't stop your sniveling. Now sit down. Ow, one would think you was my father. If I decide to teach you, I shall be worse than two fathers to you. Here. What's this for? To wipe your face. To wipe any part of your face that feels moist. Remember, that is your handkerchief and that is your sleeve. Don't mistake the one for the other if you wish to become a lady in a shop. Uh, Higgins. I'm interested. What of your boast that you could pass her off as a duchess at the embassy ball? I'll say you're the greatest teacher alive if you can make that good. I'll bet you... All the expenses of the experiment that you can't do it. And I'll even pay for the lessons. Oh, you're real good. Thank you, Captain. It's almost irresistible. She's so deliciously low, so horribly dirty. Ow, I ain't dirty. I washed my face and hands before I come, I did. I'll take it. I'll make a duchess of this draggletail gutter snipe. Ow! I'll start today, now, this moment. Take her away and clean her, Mrs. Pierce. Sandpaper if it won't come off any other way. Is there a good fire in the kitchen? Yes, but... Take all her clothes off and burn them. Ring up and order some new ones. We'll wrap her in brown paper till they come. Oh, you are no gentleman, you're not, to talk of such things. I'm a good girl, I am, and I know what the likes of you are, I do. We want none of your slum prudery here, young woman. Remember that you are to behave like a duchess. Take her away, Mrs. Pierce. If she gives you any trouble, wallop her. But I have no place to put her. Put her in the dustbin. Oh, Ow. come, Higgins, be reasonable. Yes, Mr. Higgins, you must be reasonable. You really must. You can't walk over everybody like this. I walk over everybody? My dear Mrs. Pierce, my dear Pickering, I never had the slightest intention of walking over anybody. All I ask is that we be kind to this poor girl. If I did not make my intentions clear, it was only because I did not wish to hurt her delicacy. Or yours. But sir, you can't take a girl up like that as if you were picking up, picking up a pebble on a beach. Why not? Why not? You don't know anything about her. What about her parents? She may be married. <laughs> Gone. There you go. As the girl very properly says. Gone. <laughs> Oh'd marry me. By George, Eliza, the streets will be strewn with the bodies of men shooting themselves for your sake before I am done with you. Yeah, he's off his chump he is. I don't want no balmies teaching me. I'm going away. Oh, I'm mad, am I? Very well, Mrs. Pierce. You need to order the new clothes. Throw her out. Stop, Mr. Higgins. I won't allow it. Go home to your parents, girl. I ain't got no parents. There you go. She ain't got no parents. What's all the fuss about? The girl doesn't belong to anybody, and she is no use to anyone but me. But what is to become of her? Is she to be paid anything? Do be sensible, sir. What will she want with money? She'll have her food and her clothes. She'll only drink if you give her money. Oh, you are a brute! It's a lie! Nobody ever saw the side of liquor on me. Oh, sir, you're a gentleman. Don't let him speak to me like that. Uh, does it occur to you, Higgins, that the girl has some feelings? No, I don't think so. <laughs> no feelings that we need worry about, have you, Eliza? But, sir, I really must know on what terms the girl is to be here. What is to become of her once you finish your teachings? Do look ahead a little, sir. What's to become of her if I leave her in the gutters? Answer me that, Mrs. Pierce. That's her own business, not yours, Mr. Higgins. Well, when I'm done with her, we can throw her back in the gutter, and it will be her own business again, so that's all right. Oh, you've got no art, you ain't. You don't care for nothing but yourself. Here, I've had enough of this. I'm going. Eliza, have a chocolate. How do I know what might be in them? I've had a girl's been drugged by the likes of you. Pet of good faith, Eliza. I take one half. You take the other. 
You shall have boxes of them, barrels of them every day. You shall live on them, eh? I wouldn't invite it, only I'm too lighty like to take it out of my mouth. Think of it, Eliza. Think of chocolates and taxis and gold and diamonds. No, I don't want no gold and no diamonds. I'm a good girl, I am. Excuse me, Higgins, but I really must interfere. If the girl is to put herself in your hands for six months for an experiment in teaching, she must understand thoroughly what she's getting herself into. Eliza, you are to stay here for the next, next six months, learning to speak beautifully like a lady in a floor shop. If you are good and do as you're told, you shall have a proper bedroom and money to buy chocolates and take rides in taxis. If you are naughty and idle, you shall sleep in the back kitchen among the black beetles and be watered by Mrs. Pierce with a broomstick. At the end of six months, you shall go to Buckingham Palace, beautifully dressed in a carriage. If the king finds out you are not a lady, you shall be taken to the Tower of London, where your head will be chopped off as a warning to other presumptuous flower girls. If the king does not find this out, however, you shall have a reward of seven and six to li start life with as a lady in a shop. If you refuse this offer, you will be the most ungrateful, wicked girl, and the angels will weep for you. Does that satisfy you, Pickering? Could I have put it any more plainly or fairly, Mrs. Pierce? Come with me, Eliza. Excellent. Bonne her off to the bathroom. Oh, you're a great bully, you are. I won't stay here if I don't like, and I won't let nobody wallop me. Don't answer back, girl. If I'd known what I was letting myself in for, I wouldn't have come up here. I've always been a good girl, and I won't be put upon. In six months, in three, if she has a good ear and a quick tongue, I'll take her anywhere and pass her off as anything. I'll make a queen of the barbarous wretch. Uh, Higgins, forgive the bluntness, but if I'm to be in this business, I shall feel responsible for the girl. I hope it's clearly understood that no advantage is to be taken of her position. What? That thing? Sacred, I assure you. Now come, Higgins, you know what I mean. Are you a man of good character where women are concerned? Have you ever met a man of good character where women are concerned? Uh, yes, very frequently. Well, I haven't. I find the moment that I let a woman make friends with me, she becomes jealous, exacting, suspicious, and a nuisance. I find the moment I let myself make friends with a woman, I become selfish and tyrannical. So here I am, a confirmed old bachelor and likely to remain so. After all, Pickering, I'm an ordinary man who desires nothing more than just the ordinary chance to live exactly as he likes and do precisely what he wants. An average man am I, of no eccentric whim, who likes to live his life free of strife, doing whatever he thinks is best for him. Just an ordinary man. But there's a woman in your life, and your serenity is through. She would decorate your home from the cellar to the dome, then go on to the enthralling, fun of overhauling you. Oh, let a woman in your life, and you are up against a wall. Make a plan and you will find she has something else in mind. Then so rather than do either, you'll do something else that neither likes at all. You want to talk of Keats or Milton, she only wants to talk of love. You go to see a play or ballet and spend it searching for her glove. Oh, let a woman in your life and you invite eternal strife. Let them buy their wedding bands for those anxious little hands. I'd be equally as willing for a dentist to be drilling than to ever let a woman in my life. I'm a very gentle man. Even tempered and good natured, whom you never hear complain, who has the milk of human kindness by the quart in every vein. A patient man am I, down to my fingertips. The sort who never could, ever would, let an insulting remark escape his lips. Just a very gentle man. But let a woman in your life. And patience hasn't got a chance. She will beg you for advice. Your reply will be concise. Then she'll listen very nicely. Then go out and do precisely what she wants. You are a man of grace and polish who never spoke above a hush. 
not once you're using language that would make a sailor blush. Oh, that's a woman in your life. And you are plunging in a knife. Let the others of my sex tie the knots around their necks. I prefer a new edition of the Spanish Inquisition than to ever let a woman in my life. I'm a quiet living man who prefers to spend his evenings in the silence of his room, who likes an atmosphere as restful as an undiscovered tomb. A pensive man am I, a philosophic choice, who likes to meditate, contemplate, Free from humanity's mad and human noise. Just a quiet living man. But let a woman in your life, and your sabbatical is through. In a line that never ends, come an army of her friends, come to jabber and to chatter and to tell her what the matter is with you. You have a booming, boisterous family who will descend on you en masse. You have a large Wagnerian mother with a voice that shatters glass. Oh, let a woman in your life. Let a woman in your life. Let a woman in your life. I shall never let a woman in my life. How'd you like that? Knock you for a few rows of hints, it is. <laughs> I ain't running no charity bazaar. Oh, thanks for the hospitality, George. Yes, Send I know. Send the bill to Buckingham Palace. <laughs> You can pay a few hundreds now, Alfie Doolittle. Falling into a tub of butter you have. What tub of butter? <laughs> your daughter Eliza. Oh, you lucky man, Alfie Doolittle. What about Eliza? <laughs> His daughter, and he don't even know. Moved in with swell, Eliza has smart as paint, and ain't been home for three days. And then I get a message from her this morning, telling me to send the things to 27A Wimpole Street. Care. A Professor Iggins. You know what she wants? A birdcage and Chinese fan. And she says, never mind about sending any clothes. Oh, I knew she had a future in front of her. Airy boy, the sun is shining on Mr. Alfred P. Doolittle. You know, it's going to be a good night. A man was made to help support his children, which is the right and proper thing to do. Man was made to help support his children, but with a little bit of luck, with a little bit of luck, they'll up and start supporting you. With a little bit, with a little bit, with a little bit of luck, they'll work for you. He doesn't have a toughness in his pocket, the poorest bloke you'll ever hope to meet. He doesn't have a toppers in his pocket, but with a little bit of luck, with a little bit of luck, go open up to easy street. With a little bit, with a little bit, with a little bit of luck, you're moving up. With a little bit, with a little bit, with a little bit of blooming luck. Higgins, you simply cannot go on working the girl this way, making her say her alphabet over and over again from sun up to sundown, even during meals. When will it stop? When she does it properly, of course. Is that all, Mrs. Pierce? No, sir, the mail. 
Well, pay the bills and say no to the invitations. Is that all? No, sir. There's another letter from that American billionaire, Ezra D. Wallingford. He still wants you to lecture for his Moral Reform League. Throw it away. But, sir, it's the third letter he's written you. You should at least answer it. Oh, all right. Put it on the desk. I'll get to it. If you please, sir, there's a dustman downstairs, Alfred Doolittle, who wants to see you. He says you have his daughter here. A few, I say. Send the blackguard up. He may not be a blackguard, Higgins. Nonsense, of course he's a blackguard. Well, whether he is or not, I'm afraid we shall have some trouble with him. No, I think not. If there's to be any trouble, he shall have it with me, not I with him. Do little, sir. Good morning, gentlemen. Professor Higgins. Yeah, good morning. Where? Oh. I've come to see you about a very serious matter, Governor. What do you want, Doolittle? I want my daughter, that's what I want. Well, of course you want your daughter. You're her father, aren't you? I'm glad to see there's some spark of family feeling left. She's upstairs. Take her away at once. What? Take her away. Do you expect me to keep your daughter for you? Oh, is it right, Governor? Is it fair to take advantage of a man like that? How dare the girl you? girl belongs to me. You have her. Where do I come in? How dare you come here and attempt to blackmail me? You no. sent her here on purpose. Now don't take a man up like that, Governor. The police shall take you up. This is a plant. A plot to extort money by threats. I shall telephone the police. Have I asked for a brass farthing? Have I said a word about money? I leave it to this man here. Alfred, you sent her here on purpose? No, Governor. I swear I never did. And how did you know she was here? Well, I'll only tell you if you let me get a word in. I'm willing to tell you, I'm waiting to tell you, I'm wanting to tell you. Pickering, this chap has a certain natural gift for rhetoric. Observe the rhythm of his native wood notes wild. I'm willing to tell you, I'm wanting to tell you, I'm waiting to tell you. That is the world strain in him. How did you know Eliza was here if you didn't send for her? Well, she sent for her things, but she asked for no clothes. I asked you, Governor, what was I to think? Ah, so you came to rescue her from worse than death, eh? We had just so, Governor. Very well. Mrs. Pierce? Eliza's father has come to take her away. Give her to him at once. Well, now, wait a minute, Governor. Wait a minute. I've taken a sort of liking to you, and I might not be so set on having the girl home, but what I might be open to is an arrangement of sorts. All I ask is my rights as a father, because I can see you're one of the last people to let her go for nothing. So I ask you, what is five pounds to you, and what is Eliza to me? I'll have you know, Doolittle, that Mr. Higgins' intentions are entirely honorable. Of course they are. If they aren't, I would have asked for fifty. Do you mean to say you would sell your daughter for fifty pounds? Have you no morals, man? No, Governor. Can't afford them. Neither could you if you were as poor as me. And what do you think that does to a man? It means he's up against middle-class morality for the rest of his life. And I don't mean to pretend to be deserving, I'm undeserving, and I like to be going on undeserving because I ain't pretending to be deserving. Pickering, if we were to take this man in hand for the next six months, he could choose between a seat at the cabinet and a popular pulpit at the Wales. I think we ought to give him a fiver. He'll make bad use of it, I'm afraid. Oh, not me, Governor. Uh, better satisfaction that it ain't been thrown away. It's almost irresistible. Oh, well, let's give him ten. Oh, no, not ten. The missus wouldn't have the art to spend ten. What do you think it does to a man? It makes a man feel prudent and then go buy to happiness. No, give me what I asked for. Not a penny less and not a penny more. Pickering, if we were to listen to this man for another minute, we shall have no morals left. Five pounds, I think you said. Thank you, Governor. I won't, I won't, I won't. Oh, beg my pardon, miss. I won't say those wry vowels one more time. Why, me, it's Eliza. Oh, I never knew she could clean up so good. Does me justice, doesn't she, Governor? Yeah, what are you doing here? Don't give these men any of your lip. If she gives you any of their lip, just give her a few whackings of the belt. It makes her mind better, you know? Oh, good morning, gentlemen. Cheer, Eliza. By George, there is a fellow for you. A philosophical genius of the first water. Mrs. Pierce, write to Mr. Ezra D. Wallingford and tell him that if he still needs a lecturer, he should get in touch with Alfred P. Doolittle. A common dustman, but one of the most original moralists in London. Yes, sir. Uh, what did he come for? Say your vows. I know my vows. I knew them before I came. If you know them, say them. I-E-I-O-U. Stop. A. E-I-O-U. That's what I said. I-E-I-O-U.
I know it's difficult, Miss Doolittle, but try to understand. No use explaining, Pickering. As a military man, you ought to know that. Drilling is what she needs. But to leave her, she'll be turning to you for sympathy. All right, if you insist. But try to have a little patience with her, Higgins. Of course. Say A. You ain't got no art, you ain't. A. I. Eliza, I promise you will pronounce your vowels correctly before this day is out, or there will be no lunch, no dinner, and no chocolates. Just you white and Riggins, just you white. You'll be sorry, but your tears will be too light. You'll be broke and all that money will I help you, don't be funny. Just you white and Riggins, just you white. Just you white and Riggins till you're sick. And you scream to fetch a doctor double quick. I'll be off a second lighter and go straight to the theater. Oh, oh, oh. and Riggins, just you white. Ooh, and Riggins, just you white until we're swimming in the sea. Get a cramp a lot of ways from me When you yell you're gonna drown I'll get dressed and go to town Oh, 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 and Riggins Oh, 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 and Riggins Just you, white One day I'll be famous I'll be proper and prim Go to sign chimes so often They will call it sign Jim one evening the king will say, Eliza, I'll think I want all of England, your prizes to sing. Next week on the 20th of May, I proclaim Eliza to little die. All the people will celebrate the glory of you. And whatever you wish and want, I gladly will do. Thanks a lot, King, says I, in a manner well read. But all I want is Henry Higgins' head. Done, said the King with a stroke. Good run and bring in the bloke. Then they'll march you, Henry Higgins, to the wall. And the King will tell me lies and sound the call. I'll shout, ready, aim, fire! Oh, 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 and Riggins, down you'll go, and Riggins, just you wait. The Rhine and Spine dies mindly on the plane. No, the rain in Spain stays mainly in the plane. Didn't I sigh that? No, Eliza, you didn't sigh that. You didn't even say that. Each night before you go to bed, where you used to say your prayers, I want you to repeat. The rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain 50 times. You will get much further with the Lord if you learn not to offend his ears. Now for your H's. Pickering, this is going to be ghastly. Control yourself, Higgins. Give the girl a chance. Of course. No one expects her to get it right on her first try. You see this flame, Eliza? Each time you pronounce your H properly, the flame will waver. Each time you drop your H, the flame will remain stationary. In time, your ear will hear the difference. Now, listen closely. In Hartford, Hellisford, and Hampshire, hurricanes hardly ever happen. Now, repeat after me. In Hartford, Hellisford, and Hampshire, hurricanes hardly ever happen. In Hartford, Hellisford, and Hampshire, hurricanes hardly ever happen. No, 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 no. No idea at all, you know. Should I do it over? No, oh, please, no. We must start from the very beginning. Do this. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Well, go on, go on. Ha, ha, ha. Does the same thing hold true ha, in India, Pickering? Ha, ha. This peculiar habit of not only ha, dropping a letter, ha, like the letter ha. H, but using ha, it where it shouldn't ha. be. 
You'll notice some of the Slavic people tend to do that with their G's. They'll say linger instead of linger, and then they'll turn right around and say singer instead of singer. I wonder why that's so. I must look that up. What's the matter? Why did you stop? Go on. Poor Professor Higgins. Poor Professor Higgins. Night and day he slaves away. Oh, poor Professor Higgins. All day long on his feet, up and down until he's numb. Doesn't rest, doesn't eat, doesn't touch a crown. Kind of you, kind of you, kind of you. Now listen, Eliza. How kind of you to let me come. How kind of you to let me come. No, 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 no. Kind of you. It's just like a cup of tea. Say a cup of tea. A cup of tea. No, 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 no. It's awfully good cake. I wonder where Mrs. Pierce gets it. Hmm. First rate. The strawberry tart is delicious. And oh, have you tried the plan, Kai? Try again. Have you tried the? Not you, Pickering. Try again, Eliza. A cup of tea. Can't you hear the difference? Put your tongue forward until it rests against the top of your lower teeth. Now say, cup. Cup. Now say, of. Of. Now say, cup, 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 cup. Of, 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 of. Cup, 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 cup. Of, 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 of. By Jove! What a glorious tea. Of, uh, Higgins, of, could you finish of, strawberry tart? I couldn't cup, eat another cup, bite. Cup, no thanks, cup, old chap, really. Of, it's a shame of, to waste of, it. Of, oh, it won't go cup, to waste. Cup, I do cup, know someone cup, who's awfully fond of, of strawberry of. tarts. Ow! Four, five, six marbles. There we are. Now, Eliza, I want you to read this and enunciate each word as if the marbles were not in your mouth. With blackest moss, the flower pots were thickly crusted, one and all. Each word clear as a bell. Yes, what is this? The floor puff. I could, I could. I say, Higgins, are the pebbles really necessary? If they were necessary for Demosthenes, they are necessary for Eliza Doolittle. Go on, Eliza. Yes, what is this? The floor puff. Or think it's just a word at all. I cannot understand a word, not one word. Yes, what is I say, Higgins, maybe the poem is too difficult. Why not try a simpler one, like the owl and the pussycat? By George, what a glorious poem. Pickering, I cannot understand the girl. What's the matter? Why did you stop? I swallowed one. Oh, don't worry. I have plenty more. Quit, Professor Higgins. Quit, Professor Higgins. Here are plea or stays mainly in the plain. I can't. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. Oh, come, Higgins. It's nearly three o'clock in the morning. Do be reasonable. I'm always reasonable, Pickering. Eliza, if I can go on with a blistering headache, you can. I have a headache, too. Yeah. Eliza, I know your headaches. I know your nerves are as raw as meat on a butcher's window. But think of what you're trying to accomplish. Think of the majesty and grandeur of the English language. It's the greatest possession we have. The noblest sentiments that ever flowed in the hearts of men are contained in its magical and musical mixtures of sounds. And that is what you have set yourself to conquer. And conquer it you will. Now try again. The rain in Spain Stays mainly in the plain. What was that? The 
Rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. Again. The rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. I think she's got it. I think she's got it. The rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. By George, she's got it. By George, she's got it. Now once again, where does it rain? On the plain, on the plain. And where is that soggy plain? In Spain, in Spain. The rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. The rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. In Hartford, Hedersfen and Hampshire, Hurricanes hardly happen. How kind of you to let me come. How kind of you to let me come. Now once again, where does it rain? On the plain, on the plain. And where is that blasted plain? In Spain, in Spain. The rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. The rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. Green, we are making fine progress. I think the time has come to try her out. Uh, Mr. Higgins, are you feeling all right? Quite well, Mrs. Pierce, and you? Very well, sir, thank you. Splendid. Let's test her in public and see how she fares. Uh, Mr. Higgins, I was awakened by a dreadful pounding. Do you know what that might have been? Pounding? Pounding, pounding, I heard no pounding, did you, Pickering? No. If this continues, Mrs. Pierce, you'd better see a doctor. I know, Pickering, let's take her to the races. The races? Yes, my mother's box at Ascot. You will consult your mother, of course? Of course. No, we'll surprise her. Let's go to bed. First thing in the morning, we'll go off and buy her a gown. Eliza, go on with your work. But, sir, it's early in the morning. What better time to work than early in the morning? Where does one go for a lady's gown? Which of these, of course. How do you know that? Common knowledge. Is it? Well, we mustn't get her anything too flowery. I despise those gowns with a sort of weed here and a weed there. We must get her something simple, modest, and elegant. That's what's called for. Perhaps with a sash, yes. You all have been working much too hard, and I think the strain is starting to show. Eliza, I don't care what Mr. Higgins says. Put down your books and go to bed. <laughs> I couldn't sleep tonight, not with all the jewels in the crown. I could have danced all night, I could have danced all night, and still I beg for more. I could have spread my wings and done a thousand. Don't you agree now? 
You ought to be in bed. I could have done. You're tired, Anne. So nice. You must be dead. I could have done. Your face is drawn. So nice. Your eyes are red. Now say good night, please. Turn off the light, please. It's really time for you to be in bed. I could have spread yeah, come along. my wings. Do as you're told. And done a thousand things. Oh, Mrs. Pierce. Things. Zap the scope. I've never you're not too late, miss. Be sure it's fate, miss. You'll catch a cold. I'll never know. But now it's time to sleep. I could have danced all night. I could have danced all night. And still I beg for more. I could have spread my wings and done a thousand. I don't understand. Do you mean to say that my son, Henry, is coming here to ask it today? Uh, yes, Mrs. Higgins. As a matter of fact, he is here. What a disagreeable surprise. Ask it is usually the one place I can come to with my friends and not run the risk of seeing my son, Henry. Whenever my friends meet him, I never see them again. But he had to come, Mrs. Higgins. You see, we are taking the girl to the annual embassy ball, and we needed to try her out first. I beg your pardon? You know, the annual embassy ball. Yes, I know the ball, but what? Girl? Didn't I mention that? No, you didn't. Uh, yes, it's quite simple, really. One night, I was at Covent Garden to hear one of my favorite, favorite operas, Aida. Incidentally, they didn't play either that night, they played Gata Demrung instead. Now, I'd never heard of Gata Demrung. By George, what a raggedy one. Now, this tennis chap- What about the girl, Colonel? Uh, yes, as I came out, I met Henry, who in turn met Miss Doolittle, who now lives with Henry. Lives with Henry? Is it a love affair? Heavens no, she's a flower girl. He picked her up off the curbstone. A flower girl? Yes, Higgins said to me, Pickering, you see this girl, in six months I can make a duchess of her. Nonsense, I said. Yes, I can. All right, I'll make a bet that you can't. And I did, and he is. The horses are leaving the paddock, Mrs. Higgins! I must go fetch the girl. Excuse me, Colonel. Do you mean to say that my son, Henry, is bringing a flower girl to ask it today? Yes, that's it precisely. Jolly good, Mrs. Higgins, jolly good. <laughs> Charles, you better stay close to the car. I may be leaving abruptly. Everyone who should be here is here 
What a smashing, positively dashing spectacle, the Askins opening day. At the gate are all the horses waiting for the queue to fly away. What a gripping, positively gripping moment at the Askins opening day. Horses rushing, faces flushing, heartbeats speed up. I have never been so keyed up. Any second now, they'll begin to run. Hong the bell is ringing, they are springing forward. Look, it has begun. What a frenzied moment that was Didn't they maintain an exhausting pace? Was a thrilling, positively chilling Running of the Askins opening race could be. Oh, darling, have you seen Pickering? You do look nice. I saw Colonel Pickering and Henry. Dear, I am most provoked. I've heard you've brought a common flower girl from Covent Garden to my box. Oh, darling, she'll be all right. I've taught her to speak properly, and she has strict orders as to her, her behavior. She's to keep to two subjects, the weather and everybody's health. Sort of fine day and how do you do, and not just Go on things in general. Help her along, darling, and you'll be quite safe. Safe? To talk about our health? In the middle of a race? Well, she's got to talk about something. Henry, you're not even dressed for Askit. I changed my shirt. Well, where's the girl now? Being pinned. Some of the clothes we bought didn't quite fit. I told Pickering we should have taken her with us. You're a pretty pair of babies playing with your life doll. Oh, Miss Hinesford Hill. Oh, are these people with you? Mrs. Higgins, is this your celebrated son? I'm sorry to say that my celebrated son has no manners. He may be the life and soul of the Royal Society soiree, but he'd be rather trying on more commonplace occasions. <laughs> ah! Ah, kind of Pickering, you're just in time for tea. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Higgins. Uh, may I introduce Miss Eliza Doolittle? My dear Miss Doolittle. How kind of you to let me come. Delighted, my dear. Miss Doolittle, Mrs. Lunsford Hill. How do you do? How do you do? Miss Doolittle, Lord and Lady Boxington. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? And. Freddie Ansford Hill. How do you do? How do you do? Miss Doolittle. Good afternoon, Professor Higgins. I'm so sorry you missed the first race, Miss Doolittle. It was most exciting. Will it rain, do you think? The rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain, but in Hartford, Harrisford, and Hampshire, hurricanes hardly ever happen. <laughs> How awfully funny. Uh, what is wrong with that, young man? I bet I got it right. Smashing. I do hope we don't have any unseasonably cold spells. It brings on so much influenza, and our whole family is susceptible to it. My aunt died of influenza, so they said, but it's my belief they done the old woman in. <laughs> done her in? Yes, Lord love you. Why should she die of influenza when she come through diphtheria right enough the year before? 
fairly blue with it she was. They all thought she was dead. But my father, he kept ladling gin down her throat. Then she came to so sudden that she bit the bull off the spoon. Dear me. <laughs> now, what call would a woman with that strength in her have to die of influenza? And what become of her new straw hat that should have come to me? Somebody pinched it. And what I say is, them as pinched it, done her in. Don, don her in? Don her in, did you say? Yes, yes, don her in. This is the new small talk. To do someone in means to kill them. You surely don't believe your aunt was killed. Do I not? Them she lived with would have killed her for a hat pin, let alone a hat. But it can't have been right for your father to pour spirits down her throat like that. It might have killed her. Not her. Gin was mother's milk to her. <laughs> Besides, he's poured so much down his own throat that he knew the good of it. Do you mean that he drank? Drank? My <laughs> word, something chronic. Here, what are you sniggering at? Nothing. The, the new small talk. You do it so awfully well. If I was doing it proper, what was you laughing at? Have I said anything I oughtn't? Not at all, my dear. <laughs> well, that's a mercy anyhow. What I always say is... Uh, I don't suppose there's enough time to play some bets before the next race? Uh, come, my dear. I'm afraid not. Can I pick it? I have a bet on number seven. I should be so delighted if you would take it. You'll enjoy the race ever so much more. That's very kind of you. His name is Dover. There they are again, lining up to run. Now they're holding steady, they are ready for it. Look, it has begun. Come on, come on, Dover. Come on, come on, Dover. Come on, Dover, move your blooming. <laughs> Officer, I know this is Wimple Street, but could you show me where 27A is? Right over there, sir. Thank you. Are those for sale? Yes, sir. A shilling. Here. Thank you kindly, sir. Isn't it a heavenly day? When she mentioned how her aunt bit off the spoon, she completely done me in. And my heart went on a journey to the moon. When she told about her father and the gin, and I never saw more enchanting bars than the moment when she shouted, Move your bloomin'! Yes, sir. Is Miss Doolittle at home? Whom shall I say is calling? Freddy Einsford Hill. If she doesn't remember me, tell her I'm the old chap that was snickering at her. Yes, sir. And will you give her these? Yes, sir. Thank you. I have often walked down this street before. But the pavement always stayed beneath my feet before All at once am I several stories high Knowing I'm on the street where you live Are there lilac trees in the heart of town? Can you hear a lark in any other park to town? Does enchantment pour out of every door? No, it's just on the street where you live. And oh, that towering feeling just to know somehow you are near. Any second you may suddenly appear People stop and stare 
they don't bother me For there's nowhere else on earth that I would rather be Let the time go by I won't care if I can be here on the street where you live Mr. Ainsford Hill Yes. I'm terribly sorry, sir, but Miss Doolittle says she never wants to see anyone ever again. But why? She was magnificent. Magnificent? Do you have the right address, sir? Yes, of course. Tell her or wait. But, sir, it might be days, even weeks. But don't you see? I'll be happier here. People stop and stare. They don't bother me. For there's nowhere else on earth that I would rather be Let the time go by I won't care if I can be here on the street where you If there's any mishap at the embassy tonight, if Miss Doolittle suffers any embarrassment whatsoever, it's on your head alone. I've been begging you to call off this experiment since ask it. Eliza can do anything. But suppose she's discovered. Suppose she makes another ghastly mistake. There'll be no horses at the ball, Pickering. Goodness, if anything happened, I don't know what I'd do. You could always rejoin your regiment. Higgins, this is no time for flippancy. At a time like this, the way you've driven her these last six weeks has exceeded all the bounds of common. Uh, can't you settle some place you're pacing up and down? Have a little port. It will quiet in your nerves. I'm not nervous. Uh, where is it? On the desk. The car is here, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Pierce. Are you helping Eliza? Yes, sir. Excellent. Help her indeed. How oh, but the gown doesn't fit? I warned you about those French designers. You should have gone to a good English store where you knew everybody was on our side. Have little port. No, thank you. It'll quieten your nerves. No, thank you, Pickering. Are you sure she'll retain all that you've hammered into her, Higgins? We shall see. You know what I hate about you? It's a confounded complacency. At a time like this with so much at stake, it's utterly indecent you don't have a little port. What of the girl? You act as if she doesn't matter at all. Nonsense, Pickering. Of course she matters. What you been, think I've been doing these past months? What could matter more than to take a human being and turn her into a different human being by creating a new language for her? Why, it's feeling the deepest gulf that separates class from class and soul from soul. She matters immensely. Miss Doolittle, you look beautiful. Thank you, Colonel Pickering. Don't you think so, Higgins? Not bad, not bad at all. Got by the first hurdle, but the ambassador and his wife were completely captivated. I know. I've heard several people ask about who she is. Do tell me what happened. Uh, yes. When Higgins introduced her, Madame Ambassador said, How do you do? And Eliza came right back with, How do you do? Is that all? Uh, no. When it was my turn, both the ambassador and his wife said, Colonel Pickering, who's that captivating creature with Professor Higgins? And what did you say? Well, I was stopped for a moment. 
Then I gathered myself and said, Eliza Doolittle. Ah, oh, that was quick thinking, Colonel. Thank you, Mrs. Higgins. Do you think the girl will make it? Oh, I hope so. I've grown terribly fond of Eliza. Professor Henry Higgins. Oh. Maestro, maestro. Yes. You remember me? No. Who the devil are you? Zoltan Karpasi. Is that marvelous, boy? I, I've made your name famous throughout Europe. You teach me phoetics. You cannot forget me. Why don't you shave? I have not your imposing features, your brow. No one remember me if I shave. Where did you get all those old coins? Decorations for language. The Queen of Transylvania is here this evening. I'm indispensable to her at these international parties. And this lady you bring, she fascinates everyone. Not since Miss Langley came to London, of course. His Excellency Themostane Stephanos. Oh, this so-called Greek ambassador pretends he cannot speak English. He does not fool me. He's actually the son of a Yorkshire watchmaker. He speaks so villainously he dare not utter a word of it without betraying his origin. I help him to pretend, but I make him pay through the nose. I make them all pay. I look forward to meeting your lady. Thank you. Higgins, I say! Where is Eliza? Upstairs. Last minute adjustment. Let's not risk it. I say we collect her and leave immediately. Henry, do you think it wise to stay? Stay? Why not? Miss Eliza Doolittle. Oh, Professor, you must introduce me.
is an immense achievement. Absolutely fantastic. Yep, yep. I should have tucked the whole thing up two months ago. Higgins, it is an immense achievement. I salute you. Oh, nonsense. The silly people don't know their own silly business. Tonight, old man, you did it, you did it, you did it. You said that you would do it, and indeed you did. I thought that you would rue it, I doubted you'd do it. But now I must admit it, that succeed you did. You should be given a medal, or even be made a knight. It was nothing, really nothing. All alone you hurdled every obstacle in sight. Now wait, now wait, give credit where it's due. A lot of the glory goes to you. But you're the one who did it, who did it, who did it. As sturdy as Gibraltar, not a moment did you falter. There's no doubt about it. You did it. I must have aged a year tonight. I thought that I would die of fright. Never was there a momentary lull. Shortly after we came in, I saw at once we'd easily win. And after that, I found it deadly dull. You should have heard the Uzanars, everyone wondering who she was. You'd think they'd never seen a lady before. And when the Prince of Transylvania went to meet her, and took her and to lead her to the floor. I said to him, you did it, you did it, you did it. They thought she was ecstatic and so far aristocratic, there's no doubt about it. You did it. Thank heavens for that Zoltan Karp of the... Had he, it not been for him, I should have died of boredom. Ah, oh, but see, that dreadful Hungarian, was he there? Yes, and he was up to his old tricks all right. That blackguard uses the science of speech more to blackmail and swindle than teach. He made it the devilish business of his to find out who this Miss Doolittle is. Every time we looked around, there he was, that hairy hound from Budapest. Never leaving us alone, and never have I ever known a Rudapest. Finally, I decided it was foolish not to let him have his chance with her. So I stepped aside and let him dance with her. Oozing charm from every pore, he oiled his way around the floor. Every trick that he could play, he used to strip her mask away. And when at last the dance was done, he glowed as if he knew he'd won. And with a voice too eager, and a smile too broad, he announced to the hostess that she was a fraud. No. Yavol. Her English is too good, he said, which clearly indicates that she is foreign. Whereas others are instructed in their native language, English people aren't. And although she may have studied with an expert dialectician and grammarian, I can tell that she was born Hungarian. Not only Hungarian, but of royal blood. She is a princess. All I can say is, thank God it's all over. Now at least I can go to bed without dreading tomorrow. Good night, Mr. Higgins. Good night, Mrs. Pierce. I think I shall turn in too. It has been a great occasion, Higgins. Uh, good night. Good night, Pickering. Oh, Mrs. Pierce. Oh no, I meant to tell her I wanted coffee in the morning instead of tea. Leave a little note, will you, Eliza? What the devil have I done with my slippers? There are your slippers. Oh, my. And there. Take your slippers and pray you never have a day's luck with them. What on earth? What is the matter? Is anything wrong? <gasps> Nothing wrong with you. I've won your bet for you, haven't I? You won my bet? You presumptuous insect. I won it. What did you go and throw those slippers at me for? Because I wanted to smash your face. I'd like to kill you, you selfish brute. You thank God it's all over and that you can throw me back in the gutter. Sit down and be quiet. What's to become of me? What's to become of me? How the devil should I know what's to become of you? What does it matter what becomes of you? You don't care. I know you don't care. 
You wouldn't care if I was dead. I'm nothing to you. Not so much as them slippers. Those slippers. Those slippers? I didn't think it made any difference now. Why have you suddenly begun going on like this? May I ask if you complain of your treatment here? No. Has anyone behaved poorly to you, Colonel Pickering, Mrs. Pierce? No. And you don't pretend that I have treated you badly? No. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Perhaps you're tired after the strain of the day. Have a chocolate. No, no thank you. I suppose it's only natural for you to be anxious, but it's all over now. There's nothing more to worry about. No, nothing more for you to worry about. Oh, I wish I was dead. Why, in heaven's name, why? Listen to me, Eliza. All this irritation is purely subjective. I don't understand. I'm too ignorant. It's only imagination. Nobody's hurting you. Nothing's wrong. Come, you, go to bed and have a good cry and say your prayers and you'll be quite comfortable. I heard your prayers. Thank God it's all over. But don't you thank God it's all over? Now you are free and can do what you like. But what am I fit for? What have you left me fit for? Where am I to go? What am I to do? Ah, What's so, to become of me? So that's what's worrying you, is it? I should imagine you won't have much trouble settling yourself down somewhere or other, though I hadn't quite realized you were leaving. You might marry, you know, Eliza. You see, all men are not confirmed old bachelors like me and the Colonel. Most men are the marrying sort, poor devils. And you're not so bad looking, why? You're quite a pleasure to look at sometimes. Not now, of course. You've been crying and looked like the very devil. But when you're all right and quite yourself, you're what I should call attractive. Come, you go to bed and then get up in the morning and look at yourself in the glass and you won't feel so cheap. I dare say my mother could find a fellow who would do very well. We were above that in Covent Garden. What do you mean? I sold flowers. I didn't sell myself. Now that you've made a lady of me, I'm not fit to sell anything else. Oh, tosh, Eliza. Don't insult human relations by our dragging all that cant about buying and selling into it. You needn't marry the fellow if you don't want to. But what else am I to do? Oh, lots of things. What about that old idea of the floor shop? I dare say Pickering could set you up in one. Of course, you have to pay for all, all those old togs you've been there wearing, and that with the hire of the jewelry will put a big hole in 200 pounds. Oh, come, you'll be all right. I must head off to bed. I am devilish sleepy. By the way, I was looking for something. What was it? Your slippers. Oh, yes. You shied them at me. Before you go, sir, do my clothes belong to me or to Colonel Pickering? What use would they be to Pickering? Why need you start worrying about that in the middle of the night? I want to know what I may take away with me. I don't want to be accused of stealing. You may take the whole house full if you like, except the jewels are hired. Will that satisfy you? Stop! Please! Will you take these to your room? I don't want to run the risk of their being missing. Oh, hand them over. If these belong to me instead of the jeweler, I should ram them down your ungrateful throat. This ring isn't the jeweler's. It's the one you bought me in Brighton. I don't want it now. Don't you hit me. Hit you? How dare you accuse me of such a thing? It is you who have hit me. You have wounded me to the heart. I'm glad. I have a little of my own back anyhow. You have caused me to lose my temper. Something that has rarely ever happened to me. I am off to bed. I have nothing more to say tonight. You'd better leave your own note to Mrs. Pierce about the coffee, for it won't be done by me. Forget Mrs. Pierce, forget the coffee, and forget you. And forget my own folly on having lavished my hard knowledge and the treasure of my regard on a heartless gutter snipe. Like trees in the heart of town. Can you hear a lark in any other part of town? Does enchantment pour out of every door? No, it's just on the street where you Any second you may suddenly appear People stop and stare Darling! What are you doing here? 
Oh, nothing, Miss Doolittle. I spend most of my time around here. Freddy, D you don't think I'm a heartless gutter snipe, do you? No, of course not. Where would you get that silly notion? You know how I feel about you. You know how I've written to you. Sheets and sheets. Speak and the world is full of singing and I am winging higher than the birds. Touch and my heart begins to crumble. The heavens tumble, darling, and I'm... Words, 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 I'm so sick of words. I get words all day through, first from him, now from you. Is that all you blighters can do? Don't talk of stars burning above. If you're in love, show me. Tell me no dreams filled with desire. If you're on fire, show me. for my touch don't say how much show me show me don't talk of love lasting through time make me no undying no. Someone's head resting on my knee 
to go, Alfie. Do come again, Doolittle. We value your patronage always. Thank you, my good man. Send the missus to Brighton. Thank you, Doolittle. Father. Oh, look who it is. It's been a down to spy me on misery, he did. Me on flesh and blood. Well, you can tell him I'm miserable. You can tell him that's right. What are you talking about? And what are you dressed up for? As if you didn't know. Go back to that Wimple Street devil and tell him how he's ruined me life, destroyed my happiness. What has he done to you? Ruined me life. Destroyed my happiness. Delivered me into middle class morality. Was it him, or was it not him, who wrote to an American blighter named Wallingford, who was paying £5,000 to find the most reformed socialist in England, and tell him the most reformed socialist in England was a Mr. Alfred P. Doolittle, a common dustman? That sounds like one of his jokes. Oh, it might sound like a joke to you. Tighten the lid on me, it did. Bloke went off and died and left me 5,000 pounds a month in his blooming will. Uh, Alfie, in just a few more hours, we have to do be the church. Church? Yes, church. The deepest cut of all. Why do you think I'm dressed up like such a ruddy pole bearer? Now that I'm respectable, your mother wants to be respectable. She wants to marry me. If that's the way you feel, why don't you give the money back? Well, that's just the tragedy of it, Eliza. It's easy to say, chuck it, but I haven't the nerve. Intimidated, Eliza. Intimidated, that's what we all are. Now go back to your precious professor and tell him how he's ruined your life. Not my precious professor. Oh, turned his back on you, has he? First, he delivers me into middle-class morality and then shoves you off to make me support for you. But you don't take a pence from me. You're a lady now, you can stand on your own two feet. Eliza, it's getting awfully cold in this taxi. If you would like to see me get shoved off, it's at St. George's Church tomorrow at 10. I wouldn't advise it, but you're welcome. No, thank you, Dad. Eliza, are you all finished here? Yes, Freddy, I'm all finished here. Good luck, Dad. Come along, Alfie. How much time do I got? There's just a few more hours, that's all the time you've got. A few more hours before they tie the knot. There are celebrations all over London, and all I've got to track them down in just a few more hours. I'm getting married in the morning. The bells are gonna chime Pull up a stopper Let's have a whopper But get me to the church on time I've got to be there in the morning Spruced up and looking in me prime Girls come and kiss me Show how you'll miss me But get me to the church on time if I am dancing, roll up the floor If I am whistling, me out the door For I'm getting married in the morning Ding dong, the bells are gonna chime Pull up a rumpus, but don't lose the compass And get me to the church, get me to the church Be sure to get me to the church on time I'm getting married in the morning Ding dong, the bells are gonna chime Jail me or mail me, fail me or mail me But get me to the church on time I've got to be there in the morning Spruced up and looking in me proud some bloke who's able, lift up the table But get me to the church on time If I am flying, then shoot me down If I'm sleeping, then I'm out of town 
for I'm getting married in the morning. Ding dong, the bells are gonna chime. Feather me, or Tommy, call out the army. But get me to the church, get me to the church. Be sure to get me to the church on time. to send her clothes. I told you, sir. She took them all with her. What, what? Here's a confounded thing. Eliza has bolted. Bolted? Yes, and Mrs. Pierce let her go without telling me a word about it. Well, I'm dashed. What am I to do? I got tea this morning instead of coffee. I can't find anything. I don't know the appointments I've got. Eliza would know. Of course she would know, but she's gone. Did any of you gentlemen frighten her last night? You were there, Mrs. Pierce. We hardly said a word to her. Higgins, did you bully her after I went to bed? Just the other way around. She threw the slippers at me. I never gave her the slightest provocation. The slippers came bang at my head before I uttered a word. And she used the most perfectly awful language. I was shocked. Well, I'm dashed. I don't understand it. She has been shown every possible consideration. She admitted it herself. Well, I'm dashed. Stop being dashed, Pickering, and do something. What? Call the police. What are they there for in heaven's name? But, sir, you can't give Eliza's name to the police as if she were a thief or a lost umbrella. Why not? The girl belongs to me. I want to find her. I paid five pounds for her. Quite right. A Scotland Yard, please. May I have some coffee, Mrs. Pierce? Yes, sir. Oh, good morning, old chum. 
Colonel Hugh Pickering here, 278 Wimpole Street. I'm calling to report a missing person. Anything you could do to assist in her recovery will be frightfully appreciated. Now I'm not without influence, and I'll see to it that your superiors... Uh, yes. Eliza Doolittle. About 21. I should say about 5 foot 4. Her eyes? Well... A rather neutral color. I don't know. Brown, Pickering! It's brown! Uh, brown. Uh, her hair? That one's nondescript. It's uh, brown, Pickering! It's brown! Uh, you heard the man. Brown. Yes, this is her residence. Around three and four in the morning. No. 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 No relation at all. You could say she is a very good friend. Now see here, good sir, I'm not at all pleased with the tenor of that question. What the girl does here is our affair. Your affair is to get her so she can continue doing it. What in all of heaven can have prompted her to go after such a triumph at the ball? What could have depressed her? What could have possessed her? I cannot understand the wretch at all. Higgins, I have an old school chum at the home office. Perhaps he can help. I'll give him a call. White Hall 2774, please. Yes, I'll wait. Women are irrational, that's all there is to that. Their heads are full of cotton hay and rags. They're nothing but exasperating, irritating, vacillating, calculating, agitating, maddening, and infuriating hags. Uh, Brewster Budgeon, please. Yes, I'll wait. A pickering? Why can't a woman be more like a man? Yes. Why can't a woman be more like a man? Man is so honest, so thoroughly square, eternally noble, historically fair. Who, when you win, will always give your back a pat. Why can't a woman be like that? Why does everyone do what the others do? Can't a woman learn to use her head? Why do they do everything their mothers do? Why can't they grow up like their fathers instead? Why can't a woman take after a man? Men are so present, so easy to please. Whenever you're with them, you're always at ease. Would you be slighted if I didn't speak for hours? No. Would you be livid if I had a drink or two? Not at all. Would you be wounded if I never bought you flowers? Nonsense. Why can't a woman be like you? One man in a million may shout a bit. Now and then there's one with slight defects. One, perhaps, whose truthfulness you doubt a bit. But by and large, we are a marvelous sex. Why can't a woman be more like a man? Men are so friendly, good-natured and kind. A better companion you never will find. If I were hours late for dinner, would you bellow? No. If I forgot your silly birthday, would you fuss? Nonsense. Would you complain if I took out another fellow? Never. Why can't a woman be like us? Bridge the budget, please. Boozy, you'll never, never guess who this is. Yes, it is. Uh, by George, what a memory. So good to hear your voice again, old fellow. Thirty years, is it really? Uh, yes, there's a lot of water under the uh, thing. Uh, Boozy, I'll tell you why I called. Something rather unpleasant has happened on this end. Can I come right over and see you? Great, I'll be right there. Uh, goodbye. Mrs. Pierce, I'm heading to the home office. I do hope you find her, Colonel Pickering. Mr. Higgins will miss her. Mr. Higgins will miss her? Blast Mr. Higgins, I'll miss her! Uh, oh, Pickering, Pickering! He's gone to the home office, sir. See that, Mrs. Pierce? I'm in trouble and he runs to help. Now there is a good fellow. Mrs. Pierce, you're a woman. Why can't a woman 
be more like a man. Men are so decent, such regular chaps. Ready to help you through any mishaps. Ready to buck you up whenever you are come. Why can't a woman be a chum? Why is thinking something women never do? Why is logic never even tried? Why straightening up their hair is all they ever do? Why can't they straighten up that mess that's inside? Why can't a woman be more like a man? If I were a woman who'd been to a ball, been hailed as a princess by one and by all, would I start weeping like a bathtub overflowing and carry on as if my home were in the tree? Would I go off and never tell me where I'm going? Why can't a woman be like me? And do you mean to say that after you did this wonderful thing for them, without making a single mistake, they just sat there? They never said a word to you? Never petted you, or admired you, or told you how splendid you'd been? Not a word. That's simply appalling. I should not have thrown the slippers at him. I should have thrown the fire irons. Uh, mother! Mother! Oh, I thought it wouldn't be long. Stay where you are, my dear. Uh, mother, where the devil are you? Remember, last night you not only danced with a prince, but you behaved like a princess. Uh, mother, the... Mother, the worst! You! How do you do, Professor Higgins? Are you quite well? Am I? But of course you are. You are never ill. Would you care for some tea? Don't you dare try that game on me. I taught it to you. Get up and come home and don't be a fool. You've caused me enough trouble for one morning. Very nicely put indeed, Henry. No woman could resist such an invitation. How did this baggage get here in the first place? Eliza came to see me, and I was delighted to have her. And if you don't promise to behave yourself, I shall have to ask you to leave. You mean I'm to put on my Sunday manners for this thing I created out of the squash cabbage leaves of Covent Garden? Yes, dear. That's it precisely. Eliza, how did you ever learn manners with my son around? It was very difficult. I shall never have known how ladies and gentlemen behave if it hadn't been for Colonel Pickering. He always showed me that he felt and thought about me as something better than a common flower girl. You see, Mrs. Higgins, apart from the things one can pick up, the difference between a lady and a flower girl is not how she behaves, but how she is treated. I know that I shall always be a flower girl to Professor Higgins, because he always treats me as a flower girl and always will. But I know that I shall always be a lady to Colonel Pickering, because he always treats me as a lady and always will. Henry, don't grind your teeth. The vicar is here, ma'am. Shall I show him into the garden? The vicar and the professor? Good heavens, no. I'll see them in the library. Eliza, if my son begins to break things, I give you full permission to have him evicted. Oh, and Henry, dear, if I were you, I would stick to two subjects, the weather and your health. Well, Eliza, you've had a bit of your own back, as you call it. Are you finished now, and are you going to be reasonable, or do you want any more? You want me back only to put up with your tempers, and pick up your slippers, and fetch and carry for you. I never said I wanted you back at all. Oh, indeed. Then what are we talking about? About you, and not about me. If you come back, I shall treat you just as I have always treated you. I can't change my nature, and I don't intend on changing my manners. Why... My manners are just the same as Colonel Pickering's. That's not true. He treats a flower girl as if she was a duchess. And I treat a duchess as if she was a flower girl. Oh, I see. The same to everybody. Just so, Eliza. The great secret is not having bad manners or good manners or any particular set of manners, but having the same manner towards all human souls. The question is not whether I treated you badly, but whether you have ever seen me treat anyone else better. I don't care how you treat me. I don't mind your swearing at me. I shouldn't mind a black eye. I've had one before this, but I won't be passed over. Then get out of my way. 
You talk about me as if I were a motor bus. And so you are a motor bus. I'll bounce and go and no consideration for anyone. But I can get along without you. Don't think I can't. Of course you can. I told you you could. You never wondered, I suppose, whether I could get along without you. Don't you try to get around me. You'll have to. And so I shall, without you or any other human being on earth. But I shall miss you, Eliza. I have learned something from your idiotic notions. I confess that humbly and gratefully. Well, you have my voice on your gramophone. When you feel lonely, you can listen to a recording. It's got no feelings to hurt. I can't duplicate your soul. Oh, you are a devil! You can twist the heart in a girl as easily as some can twist her arms to hurt her. What am I to come back for? For the fun of it. That's why I took you on. And you may throw me out tomorrow if I don't do everything you want me to. Yes, and you may walk out tomorrow if I don't do everything you want me to. And live with my father? Yes, or sell flowers. Or would you rather marry Pickering? I wouldn't marry you if you asked me, and you're nearer my age than what he is. Then he is. I'll talk as I like. You're not my teacher now. That's not what I want, and don't you think it? S I've always had chaps enough wanting me that way. Freddie Hill writes to me twice and three times a day, sheets and sheets. Oh, in short, you want me to be as infatuated about you as he is? No, that's not the sort of feeling I want from you. I want a little kindness. I know I'm a common, ignorant girl, and you a book-learned gentleman, but I'm not dirt under your feet. Sit down and be quiet. That's not a proper answer to give me. It's the only answer you get until you stop being a plain idiot. If you're going to be a lady, you're going to have to stop feeling neglected if the men you know don't spend half their time sniveling over you and the other half giving you black eyes. You find me cold and feeling selfish, is that it? Very well. Be off to the sort of people you like. Marry some sentimental hog or other with lots of money. If you can't appreciate what you've got, you better get what you can appreciate. Oh, I can't talk to you! You turn everything against me! I'm always in the wrong! But don't you think you have me under your feet to be trampled and talked down? I'll marry Freddy as soon as I'm able to support him. Freddy, the poor chap who couldn't get a job as an errand boy even if he had the guts to try for it. Woman, do you not understand? I have made you a consort for a king. Freddy loves me. That makes him king enough for me. I don't want him to work. He wasn't brought up to it as I was. I'll go and be a teacher. What will you teach in heaven's name? What you taught me. I'll teach phonetics. I'll offer myself as an assistant to that brilliant Hungarian. What? That imposter, that humbug, that toady ingoramus? Woman, you take one step in that direction and I shall wring your neck. Do you hear? Uh, ring away! What do I care? Uh, that's done, you Henry Higgins it has. Now I don't care that for your bullying and your big talk. What a fool I was. What a dominated fool. To think you were the earth and sky. What a fool I was, what an adulbated fool, what a mutton headed dolt was I. No, my reverberating friend, you are not the beginning and the end. You fool, there isn't a thought in your head or a word in your mouth that I haven't put there. There'll be spring every year without you England still will be here without you There'll be fruit on the tree and a shore by the sea There'll be crumpets and tea without you Art and music will thrive without you Somehow Keats will survive without you And there still will be rain on that plain down in Spain Even that will remain without you I can do still rule the land without you Windsor Castle will stand without you And without much ado We can all muddle through without you You brazen wretch Without your pulling it The tide comes in Without your twirling it The earth can spin Without your pushing them The clouds roll by If they can do without you ducky so can i i shall not feel alone without you i can
can stand on my own without you. So go back in your shell, I can do bloody well without. By George, I really did it, I did it, I did it. I said I'd make a woman, and indeed I did. I knew that I could do it, I knew it, I knew it. I said I'd make a woman and succeed, I did. Eliza, you're magnificent. A moment ago, you were a millstone around my neck. Now you're a tower of strength, a consort battleship. I like you like this. Goodbye, Professor Higgins. I shall not be seeing you again. Mother, mother! What is it, Henry? What she, has happened? She's gone! Well, of course. What did you expect? What am I to do? Do without, I suppose. And so I shall. If the Higgins oxygen burns up her little lungs, let her seek some stuffiness that suits her. She's an owl, sickened by a few days of my sunshine. Do without. I can do without anyone. I have my own soul, my own spark of divine fire. Bravo, Eliza. <laughs> Grown accustomed to her face. She almost makes the day begin. I've grown accustomed to the tune. She whistles night and noon. Her smiles, her frowns, her ups, her downs are second nature to me now. Like breathing out and breathing in. I was serenely independent and content before we met Surely I can always be that way again And yet, I've grown accustomed to her looks Accustomed to her voice Accustomed to her face <sighs> Mary Freddy, what an infantile idea What a heartless, wicked Bring this thing to do. She'll regret it. She'll regret it. It's doomed before they take the vow. I can see her now, Mrs. Freddy Einsford Hill, in the wretched little flat above the store. I can see her now, not a penny in the till, and the bill collector beating at the door. She'll try to teach the things I taught her, and end up selling flowers instead, begging for her bread and water while her husband has his breakfast in bed. In a year or so, when she's prematurely gray and the blossom in her cheek has turned to chalk, she'll come home and lowly he will have upped and run away with a social climbing heiress from New York. Poor Eliza! How simply frightful! How humiliating! How delightful! How poignant it will be on that inevitable night when she hammers on my door in tears and rags. Miserable and lonely, repentant and contrite, will I take her back or throw her to the wolves? Show her kindness or the treatment she deserves? Will I take her back or throw the baggage out? I'm a most forgiving man. The sort who never could, never would, Take a position and staunchly never budge Just a most forgiving man But I shall never take her back Though she were crawling on her knees Let her shiver, let her moan, let her promise to atone I shall slam the door and let the hellcat freeze Manny Freddy, ha! So used to hear her say good morning every day Her joys, her woes, her highs, her lows are second nature to me now Like breathing out and breathing in I'm very grateful she's a woman and so easy to forget 
Rather like a habit one can always break And yet I've grown accustomed to the trace Of something in the air Accustomed to her face flower shop instead of selling flowers at the corner of Tottenham Court Road. But that won't take me unless I can talk more genteel. He said he could teach me. Well here I am ready to pay, not asking any favour, and he treats me as if I was dirt. I know what lessons cost and I'm ready to pay. It's almost irresistible. She's so deliciously low, so horribly dirty. I washed my face and hands before I come I did. Eliza. Where the devil are my slippers? But, sir, it's early in the morning. What's better time to work than early in the morning? Where does one go for a lady's gown? Are you stupid or what? You're famous in the world as your oyster. Your accent's changed. Uh, yes. In the nice days, a fancy claim with the pearl inside, by the way. Yeah, you, rubbed, uh, you rubbed this book three times and it uh, came out of the book. The, the boy book gives you a little click in the neck, doesn't it? So it's a book now, nonetheless. <laughs> Well, the papa had them 40 pieces, and he had a thousand tails. Fast to your in luck, cause up your sleeve, you got a bad man, you never fail. You got some power in your corner now, some heavy ammunition in your cam. You got some punch to possess, yeah, who and how, so you gotta do is rub that lamp, and I'll say, Mr. Alonzo, what will your pleasure be? Let me take your auto, drop it down, you ain't never had a friend like me. Life is your restaurant and I'm your mate to see. Come on, whisper what it is you want. You ain't never had a friend like me. Yes, sir, we pride ourselves on service. You're the boss, the king, the shy. Say what you wish, it's yours to push a little more by the lavage. 
have some of column A, try all of column B. I'm in the mood to help you, dude. You ain't never had a friend like me. That's Toady and Ignoramus. Woman, you take one step in that direction and I'll wring your neck, do you hear? Ring away? What do I care? That's done, you Henry Higgins it has. Now I don't care that for your bullying and your big talk. Dropping ages anywhere, speaking English any way they like. Hey, you sir, did you go to school? They never taught him to take instead of time. Here are Cornish men are worse, here are Yorkshire men are worse. I'd rather hear a choir singing flat. Chickens cackling in a barn, just like this one. 
Wow, what a word. <laughs> wow.